I have a lot of things that could sample, and there are a few standouts in my collection here today that I'd like to compare. We're going to rate all of them in terms of control and standout features. Learning curve, 10 being the easiest and one being extremely difficult. Portability, audio and exporting options. Compatibility with other gear and also bang for your buck. So like the price versus what you get with the instrument. This is a rating according to my own experience. So I'll do my best to touch on all the things that stand out to me within each of these units. This is a deep dive, my friends. So strap yourselves in. We have a lot to go through in this video. If you'd like to jump to anything specific, there are timestamps or chapters linked in the description. Today's sponsor is DistroKid. They are a music distribution platform that I personally use. They're especially geared towards independent artists and producers, and we'll be talking more about them later in the video. So let's just dive right into it, starting with the MPC. This is definitely my most beastly sampler. It's basically a DAW in a box. In terms of control and standout features, sweet baby Jesus. I don't even know where to start. Of course, you could cover all the basics, so pitching your samples, ADSR. You could, of course, very finely chop up your samples as well. There's war a warp sample section, envelopes, LFO. Everything you have, everything you need is right here for sampling. Ultra tight and precise sample cutting. It's pretty much the best in the game for that. It's very, 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 very pr 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 precise. Very juicy and smooth knobs. I would say that the feel of this instrument in general is the best by far in this comparison. So if you're like a touchy feely sort of producer, these pads are really, really juicy. You of course have a nice descriptive screen right here, more descriptive than any other instruments in this comparison as well. For some people, this makes a big difference. Some people don't really like a descriptive screen because maybe it reminds them of a computer. They might be get, trying to get away from that. It's common knowledge, there's nothing quite as powerful as a DAW at this point, but the MPC-1 or you know the other MPCs as well, it's about as close as you're going to get to that. But the advantage, of course, is that it's standalone. You have a very touchy-feely surface all just in one box. You've got your grid here where you could enter in notes if you'd like. You could erase notes. You could select several notes at once, zoom in and out of the grid. The idea is to create or use a pre-programmed kit or drum program, which you could enter into sequences, and the sequences are broken down into tracks. And several sequences make up a song. Of course, there is a song mode as well where you could sequence different patterns. In terms of a kit or drum program, it's basically whatever you have loaded on these pads. So this is actually a pre-programmed kit that I'm not crazy about. I'm gonna assign samples, browse, and I'm gonna search, let's say, house. I want a house kit. Do it. So these are examples of kits that you could use. I like this one, load. Give that a second, and I'm gonna scroll down to that. And there's that kit. Each of these pads is broken down into its own track, so I could even go into that, select a specific pad, and from there I could add plugins onto each of these pads up to four. You could, of course, use your own samples. I would actually encourage you to use your own samples, but for this example, we're just gonna use this stock pattern. I'm just gonna perform something and I'm gonna give it a shot. Two, three, eh. So that's been auto-quantized. I'm going to enter something in over top of that. And that's the groove. We'll take a look at the basic plugins that you have access to. So let's say on this kick, I'm going to select a plugin, delay reverb, dynamic. So that's compressors. Um, there's also a sidechain compression, EQ filter, harmonic. Vintage effects, these are really cool. I've actually done a video on some of my favorite stock effects on the MPC one, so here's, here it is. Another thing I should clarify is that, like I said, you could add individual effects onto each of these pads. You could also affect this entire kit on top of that. And you might think that there's like just so much going on here for a standalone instrument that it's too much information for the MPC one, it's just gonna start bugging out, in which case I'm gonna tell you that you're wrong. In terms of adding information internally with the MPC-1, it has no problem at all with that. It's very powerful. It goes even deeper than that. So from one sequence to the next, you could actually change which plugins you add to which pad. You don't necessarily have to stay consistent throughout the entire track. So 
There's just so much you could do with this. In terms of effects routing, you have bus control as well. So let's say you want to sidechain an entire kit to just the kick. Yes, you're able to do that. There are some, in my opinion, pretty good sounding VSTs within the MPC-1. Honestly, I haven't used these that much. I just use this as a sampler. This is what tube synth sounds like. What else? Let's go to Odyssey. Right, so it's it's a lot like a DAW. There's like software instruments built into the unit. As I mentioned earlier, you could build a full on song with the MPC-1. You could also effects that song in real time. There's a performance effects page called XY here. So we're off to a really strong start here in terms of control and standout features. In comparison to the rest of my collection, I'm gonna give the MPC-1 a strong 10 on 10. In my personal experience, I thought that the learning curve of the MPC-1 was pretty quick, mostly because the screen is just so descriptive. There's a lot of information out there as well on YouTube. I would like to clarify though that I've been a DAW user for like 10 years now, so I had a pretty strong understanding of how a DAW works. So if you don't have that sort of background, I could imagine the MPC-1 actually being like the most difficult one on this list. So if you already have a clear understanding of things like effects buses, adding plugins, tracks, sequences, patterns, things like that, because in terms of like Dollis production, even though some people might not even consider this Dollis because it's so similar to a DAW, this is as deep and complex as you can get. So based on my experience, I'm gonna give this a 7.7 .7 on 10 in terms of the learning curve. Compatibility, so I actually did a video on this exact topic specifically with the MPC-1. Here it is if you'd like to get deeper into it. This is another category that the MPC-1 is a beast in, if it's the master or brain of the operation. It's definitely not a beta, it's an alpha. It likes to control things. It does receive media information on a very basic level. In my experience though, once you try to control it, especially with media information, it bugs out immediately. And I'd like to clarify that this is after update 2.11, which is the latest update. Update 2.10 was actually more compatible in terms of being controlled by other instruments than 2.11. So it, they actually took a step back with the new update. And to be honest, this definitely rubbed me the wrong way because let's say, for example, you're on version 2.10, you've prepared a specific set where you're controlling the MPC-1, everything works great, and then you update to 2.11 and things just start bugging out. Like that would be infuriating. <laughs> More specifically, my experience was that when I bus tracks together and then tried to control effects on those buses from an external MIDI controller, it just wasn't having it at all. It was basically bugging out on me on every turn, so I asked some local friends and the consensus was that MPC in general is great for a studio instrument, but once you bring it into the live world and you push it a little bit, it's gonna bug out. So in that case, it's not super reliable. So because of these letdowns that I've experienced personally, I'm gonna to have to give this a 4.5 on 10 in terms of compatibility. But as I mentioned, if you're using it as the brain of the operation to control other instruments, then I guess you'd give it a much higher score. The MPC-1 has great audio exporting options. You could export individual pads from each drum program or like just the entire program onto a hard drive. So this is, this is great. The one thing I'm gonna say is that composing within the MPC or anywhere, it, it could get a little bit messy. And unless your programs and sequences are like consistently numbered throughout the song, you'll have to export one sequence at a time and not the entire song at once, which is definitely more time consuming. In my experience, at least with the MPC-1, it does get a bit confused if your tracks, programs, and sequences aren't consistently numbered. So for example, let's say in sequence one, you have a bass on track one, and then in sequence two, it happens to be on track two for whatever reason within your process. That's what confuses the MPC-1, and it'll print the wrong instrument onto a given track. So. Just something to be aware of. So there's that little hiccup. Hopefully they fix that with an update. I'm gonna give this a 7.5 in terms of audio exporting options. Portability, it's small, it's great. If you have this perfectly sized case from Analog Cases, this is the one that I use for it. It's very sexy inside as well. Always recommend Analog Cases for uh, all of my electronic instruments. This is one of Akai's most portable units, if not the most portable. I know that the, uh, the live, is battery powered, so that I guess that's a bit more portable, although it's it's a bigger model. So I guess that's the only thing that it's not battery powered. Honestly, I don't mind that because batteries, you know, unless they're rechargeable, are just so bad for the environment. Personally, when I want to go outside to jam, I use the Jackery, what's it called? Jackery Explorer 300, which is 
great. It's rechargeable. I've been using it for like a year. It's super powerful. Yeah. Gonna give this an 8.78 on 10 for portability. I think that compared to the competition, the NPC One is very well priced for what it can do. They also just keep dropping updates on it, which definitely increases the value of the instrument as time goes on. It's built well, it's durable. Pads do feel amazing. I bought it about two, two and a half years ago at full price uh, as an experienced synth user. I'm super happy with it. We're gonna give it a 9.3 out of 10 for bang for your buck. The Electron Digitact. The Digitact is actually advertised as a drum machine, but it's very commonly used as a sampler, a groove box. I'm currently going through a bit of like a musical transformation, but a, a couple months ago, I was really into that 120 BPM house tempo. The Digitact is perfect for that. It, it very quickly became the centerpiece of my Dallas setup. I actually did a video on this exact topic. Here it is. The Digitact also has great control and plenty of standout features. I find that out of the Electron boxes, it's the smoothest workflow. For sure. A lot of people, myself included, think that the other boxes are just a bit more menu divey than the Digitact. Same thing with the Octatrack. I know it's not an Electron box, but that thing is like <laughs> backwards in a good way. <laughs> There's just something about the Digitact. It has a similar menu option as the Digitone, but they brought like the important performance menu pages to the top. Like they're at the surface and they're a lot easier and quicker to access. Is the screen as descriptive as the MPC one? Not even close. Do you have that same DAW in a box type workflow? Nope. It's a completely different thing and it's based off the workflow of a tracker. To me, Electron equals clever and sequencer. To me, it's a lot more intuitive than the sequencer on the MPC one. There's a maximum of 64 steps and you can enter a different sample on every step within a pattern if you wanted to. So that goes deep. You can essentially pinpoint and param lock any given effect. So let's say reverb delay on any of the steps as well. You are definitely more limited in terms of the amount of effects in comparison to the MPC. You've got reverb delay, an option of two LFOs per track. The Digitact has eight tracks internally. So for example, I'm gonna solo these drums. I'm actually gonna decrease the length of this pattern, make it one bar. gonna go over to my hi-hat. I'm gonna select this last note specifically, reverb and delay. I'm gonna blast it on that last note just to give you an example. And there it is. That's been param locked into the pattern. And so that's something that I could do on an individual step basis. So it goes deep. I will say that time stretching samples on the Digitact is doable, but it's hard to get away from it sounding not great. It sounds really choppy, sort of. Chopping and slicing samples in general, I find is a little bit awkward with the Digitact. In terms of sampling, it's definitely an unusual workflow compared to the other units in this video. It downgrades samples to mono, but the overall output is in stereo, so you are able to pan things if you want. This could definitely be a deal breaker for a lot of you, but personally, I actually like the way samples sound to the Digitact. Somehow everything sounds a little bit darker and that shapes the type of music that you create within the box. They recently just added song mode as well, which is very useful for sketching out tracks and creating songs. I find that that addition really opens up the box to a completely new set of musicians. Like for example, if you're a solo artist and you just wanna play a track, maybe play guitar over it, the Digitac could be useful for that. So I'm going to give this an 8.5 on 10 for control and standout features. As I mentioned, a lot of the important things that are happening here on the Digitac are on the surface, but as far as most instruments that are small and have a lot of features, there's a lot packed into this thing. It's just something to get used to, but there's a lot of shift or function functions. So each of these buttons has like a dual function. And I mean, the NPC is the same, but that screen is just much more descriptive. It's, it's, uh, it's much more helpful in my opinion. The Electron workflow is something to get used to for sure. Even the easier, more fluid boxes. I think it's, it's, uh, it's a very quirky, like particular workflow, just like the buttons, the, the menu, the, the font, there's just something about it. That's not as straightforward as the NPC at first. It's a workflow that's exclusive to Electron. All of their boxes have like a similar type of thing going on, but with little differences. 
to get you hooked. So if you're already familiar with that workflow, maybe you're coming from another Electron instrument, then this will be a lot easier to catch on to. If not, it's something to get used to. You might have to have a few sessions before really catching on, but that could be said about most Dallas instruments. But I think that the payoff for that extra effort is really worth it. Once you're fluid with it, the DigiTac's dope. I'm gonna give it a 7.23 on 10 for learning curve. The DigiTac is so fluid, I've yet to discover a bug with it in terms of like syncing it to other instruments. And that says a lot. I've run into a lot of problems with other instruments especially when it comes to syncing and MIDI. It could be the brain of the operation. It sends MIDI like a pro. It receives MIDI like a pro. Let's say if you want to control it with a MIDI controller, similar to the other Electron boxes. I've done the same thing with the Digitone, the Octatrack as well. They're killer for that sort of thing. So much like the Digitact itself, anything that you run through the mixer has this nice, like buttery, dark quality to it. The effects sound great. You could run two mono instruments or one stereo. You could pan those instruments as well. You have volume control. You can throw some effects onto these external audio sources coming into the mixer. The reverb sounds so good, so smooth. One of my favorite reverbs. The delay sounds great too. Haven't run into any issues. Haven't heard of anyone else running into any sort of issues in terms of compatibility. So like I said, hard 10 on 10. If you'd like to hear that sound, here's a performance that I did with the DigiTact using song mode, actually. Audio exporting is also a dream with the DigiTact and the other Electron boxes, thanks to their software, Overbridge. You could bounce individual stems in real time via USB into any DAW. I'm predominantly a Logic user, and this is pretty much exactly how I compose my track intact. I just performed the track, dropped it into my DAW, mixed it, dressed it up, and then released it. Based on the research that I did, there were some bugs in the past, but Electron seems to have fixed everything in terms of uh, using the software, software compatibility with the boxes. Solid, hard, 10 on 10. Portability, I mean, it's, it's pretty much just as portable as the MPC. It's a little bit smaller, but also not battery powered. So it's the same sort of situation. If you want to jam outside, you're gonna to have to bring a battery. For how capable it is, you're definitely saving some desk space. So I'm gonna give it a nine on 10 for portability. Lots of bang for your buck here. If you're a Dallas like hardware performer and you're looking for reliable gear to perform with, this might be it over the MPC-1. It doesn't do as much, like it doesn't have as much to offer, but the MPC, as I mentioned earlier, is a bit more of a studio tool because it's not as reliable. This I think is more of a performance tool. From what I've seen and experienced, some of the best that Electron has to offer, I'm gonna give it an 8.5 on 10. We're not even gonna mention the OG404 here because it's pretty much obsolete to the MK2 at this point. The workflow of the OG404 is just way too clunky in my opinion. 4.1 on 10, but about the Mark II. I've actually already done a comparison between the 404 Mark II and the MPC-1, so if you're looking for a another dimension, here it is for you. The thing with the Mark II is that they're coming out fierce and fast with the updates. There's been, I think, four since it's been released uh, about a year and a half ago. That's a lot of updates. They added in a step sequencer, which is killer. It has a DJ mode, which no other unit in this video offers. And it's a pretty solid DJ mode as well. It's, it's like, it's not a gimmick. The pattern sequencer is also very solid. It could be used as like a song mode of sorts. Much like the tactile feel of the MPC-1, you've got these pads, which you could finger drum on if you'd like. I will say that they're not quite as strong as the MPC-1 pads. They're a bit glitchy. There's also a slight bit of latency, which does throw me off. And when I say glitchy, I mean that they're almost overly sensitive. Like it's very easy to get a double hit. And of course the defining and unique feature of the 404 multi-effects. If you know me in hardware, you know that I'm all about these effects. I've done several videos on the 404 Mark II, as well as one specifically on multi-effects. I've left a link for that in the description if you're interested. Dozens of effects to choose from, many of which do sound spectacular. So resampling with these effects is an absolute dream. There's also four buses to choose from. So bus one and bus two, these are like performance buses, which you could just bounce back and forth from. On top of that, you have EFX settings. So this is like within the menu, you have bus three and four. These are considered master effects because they're much less accessible while you're performing. 
In my opinion, I think that the effects alone make the Mark II super unique and worth it, but it has a long list of other things to offer. The step sequencer does have decent control, but it doesn't feel the same as the sequencer on the MPC-1 and especially on the Digitact or any other electron sequencer. You don't have that same sort of like hands-on-ness with the Mark II's sequencer. The MPC definitely has a similar vibe to the Mark II and it just completely overshadows it in terms of what it has to offer, the amount of control that you have over your parts as we went through. On top of that, it's just the perfect size for tactile finger drumming stuff. Whereas I find that these pads are slightly too compact. So it really depends on what you're trying to go for with the MPC. There's, there's less limits, but if you like those limits, you think they help you creatively, then maybe the Mark II is a good choice for you on top of everything else that it has to offer. I'm gonna give it an eight on 10 in terms of standout features. Learning curve, there is so much going on in such a small space, especially with the new updates. They like, they stuff so much information into here. So for example, DJ mode, D and J, this opens up a completely new part of the instrument. Each of these pages has dual function, fixed velocity, 16, you know, everything here, chromatic, exchange. You've got the pattern sequencer, which you could jump in and out of. These are my uh, current patterns. Of course, you could enter into sample mode where, where you're pitching, speeding up, slowing down the sample, uh, the volume of each sample. Multi effects here, which you're able to scroll through, not to mention that many of these effects have two pages of parameters. <laughs> not to mention that there are five basic effects here on the surface as well, which you can control with these knobs. There's a lot to learn and it can definitely get confusing. At moments, it does feel like the instrument is like, it's on top of itself. So just like anything else, it does take that extra time to get fluid and understand, but in particular with the Mark II, I think it'll take even a little bit more extra time, in my opinion. But of course, don't worry, I have plenty of Mark II content for you to dissect. <laughs> I'm gonna give the learning curve a six on 10. It takes some getting used to. Compatibility with other gear, it's been reliable for me so far. If you're fortunate enough to own a Mark II, run everything external through this box and affects it, you'll be glad that you did. In terms of media compatibility, it's also great. So you're actually able to open up all of these bus effects as well as the master effects and blow up the controls onto a MIDI controller. That's very easy to do. In fact, I've left a video on how to do it in the description. <laughs> this is something that would work great in DJ mode. So you just load up your tracks, play the tracks and have access to all of your controls all at the same time. It's a really clever way to open up the instrument and have all of your effects in the same spot instead of having to menu dive from one effects to the next. One thing I find about the audio quality of the Mark II, I find that if you boost it past like 50%, the low end gets a little bit distorted. So of course the workaround for that is to drop the volume and then raise the volume of whatever audio source uh, you need to, maybe a mixer or you know, an effects pedal, something like that. 8.76 on 10 for compatibility. Audio exporting compared to the competition, four on 10, sorry, Roland. <laughs> exporting projects onto your SD card and then dropping that project into another Mark II is an easy process. Bouncing or exporting audio to your DAW in terms of like separating tracks is not possible. Hopefully they'll maybe fix that with an update. Space and portability, it's the most portable in this comparison. So I'm gonna have to give that a 10 on 10. It takes batteries. I don't suggest that you use eight batteries to power this thing because you know, the environment. It's a bit more of a convenient shape. It takes up less desk space than the other units. And the amount that you could do within that space is just crazy, so. 10 on 10. The value of this thing, I think since it's been released has gone up like crazy. They just keep dropping updates on it and big updates too. Is it as powerful as the MPC-1 or the Digitact? In some ways it actually is in terms of the effects. It has DJ mode. Overall, I'm gonna have to say, no, you just don't have the same control or precision as with the other units mentioned, but it's also quite a bit cheaper than the other units. Of course, it all depends on what you're looking for and hopefully this video is helping you with that. I'm gonna give it a 9.5 on 10 for bang for your buck. And now onto our next sampling instrument, the OP-1 or the OP-1 field. Side note, I just received the OP-1 field today, so I'm not like super well versed with it yet. I know it's very similar to the OG OP-1, which I'm very well versed with. They didn't really add that many additions to the sampler with the field. I do know that you're able to zoom in a little bit closer uh, into your samples, much like the NPC. They did add a ton of other features though. Here's a list of them. 
I know that the OP1 isn't just a sampler, but the reason why I'm including it within this list is because it's different and I think it's relevant and comparable to other samplers today. I see a lot of producers use the OP1 like exclusively as a sampler, so it made sense to include it in this video. As I use the OP1 more and more, I find that its standout features are weirdly its limits. In terms of sampling, there are limits every which way with the OP1. It's just so simple. Drop any sample into it and it gets equally auto chop between these 24 keys. Not sure if you just noticed that, but the sampling time is now 24 seconds instead of 12. So that's a new addition. You could change the pitch of any of these keys. So I'm gonna choose the first one, pitch it down, make it a longer sample. Let's just take the whole groove. I'm going to raise the volume of that. I could change the attack. That's a new feature with the OP1 field. Panning is on this page. That's another new feature. Add one of the OP1's weird effects. Cow is, is a classic, but it's overdone. Let's go to Mother. This is a new effects. Oh, there must be an LFO in there. I don't know about you, but these graphics definitely give me X-Files vibes. Do, 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 do. So I just sampled in drum mode. If I went over to synth mode and did the same thing, let me just set this up here again. Just gonna make sure that I'm on the sampler in synth mode. Yes, sampler, and let's go. From there, I can play full on chords. I could of course add effects to this sample as well. Shift three, mother again. Maybe throw that into the arpeggiator. And just like that, we have maybe the starting point of an idea. It's a very spontaneous instrument. You tend to come up with things quickly and oftentimes they're fun, good ideas. In the context of this comparison, it's not comparable to let's say the MPC-1 or DigiTact to get from start to finish. But since I've owned the OG OP1, it's been like three years now, it's consistently been the freshest idea starter. It's that ease of use that's so simple and streamlined and weirdly, it's not a workflow that's been copied from any other company or instrument. Like I can't really even think of anything that's even close. It's just not the same in my opinion. In terms of the actual features of the sampler, that's about it. So like why even mention it? <laughs> Well, the fact that the OP1 has a built-in keyboard within the sampler also changes the sampling experience. Then obviously the other attractions of the OP1 are that it does it all. It's a pretty heavy digital synthesizer. It's sort of shaped the sound of a lot of music over the past decade. But in terms of the sampler, which is the point of this video, it's so bare bones that we can't really give it the same score as the other samplers. It's just so simple. Maybe that's what you're looking for. We're gonna give it a 6.5 on 10. A lot of people might disagree with me on this next point. I find that because of the simplicity, especially of the sampler of the OP1, it's very straightforward, it's easy to use. I find that the learning curve of the sampler specifically is pretty quick. It's the weight of all the other elements of the OP1 that make it a bit more difficult to learn. It seems to be the type of instrument that you either click with or you don't. Some people think it's really easy to learn, other people don't. It really depends on your background. In terms of the learning curve of the sampler, 9.22 out of 10. Compatibility with other gear, they've made some pretty major improvements here, especially compared to the OG OP1. It's still not as fluid and compatible as, let's say, Electron gear. Because this is such a new unit, they released it less than a year ago. Just make it easy. Just make everything easy. Make MIDI compatibility easy. TE is notoriously difficult, buggy, and kind of exclusive when it comes to compatibility with other instruments. As I mentioned, I just received the field today as in like filming this video today. So I don't really feel comfortable giving this uh, a score yet. I will say that with the OP1, 3.1 on 10 because the compatibility is terrible. Undecided score for the OP1 field. Audio exporting options on the OG OP1 are dated. But with the field, you're able to record directly from USB into your computer. So it's a similar sort of process as Electron with Overbridge. Portability with the OP1 is an obvious 10 on 10. It's 
battery powered rechargeable battery so you don't have to plug batteries into here. It's tiny, you can fit this thing anywhere, it barely takes up any desk space. 10 on 10. In light of them raising the price on us from the OG OP1 to the OP1 field, it is a much stronger unit but it is so expensive. I can't justify giving it a high score in this department. A company like, let's say Roland comes out with the SP404 Mark II, it's not too much more expensive than the, the OG. I guess TE isn't quite as generous, let's say. I mean, no no judgment, but uh, this, this is a rating video, so I gotta give it a score. 2.8 on 10. There are a few other notable mentions in my collection, but before we get to that, let's talk about today's sponsor, DistroKid. Here are three reasons why I chose DistroKid over other music distributors. One, they're on the cutting edge of new social media and music promotion features. They're the pioneers in that sense because their platform is made specifically for independent artists and producers who depend on those sorts of tools to promote their music. Two, the amount of stores that DistroKid uploads to is insane and they also keep track of smaller or up and coming stores uh, that you might not even know exist. A perfect example of this is how Spotify is actually not my biggest streaming earner. It's KKBox, which is a platform that doesn't even exist in North America, or at least it's not accessible here. So I had no idea about this platform, DistroKid, took care of this for me and now they're my biggest earners. <laughs> Three, banking info and withdrawal is super easy to set up. DistroKid delivers 100% of your streaming earnings to you. They don't take any cut. Independent artists and producers, you know what to do. Let's get back to the video. Other notable mentions, starting with other teenage engineering gear. This is more of like the, uh, the rapid fire section of this video. Some of you may have thought that it'd be fair to mention like the pocket operator samplers, so the PLKO, maybe even the OB4. You could actually argue that that's a more appropriate choice than the OP1 because it's like specifically a sampler uh, in terms of the PLKO. And it is a great sampler. It's actually one of the easiest samplers to use as well. It's, it's so quick, but compared to the other gear in this video, I just felt like it wouldn't be fair or worth it to compare. I mean, I guess portability is next level, but compared to the MPC, SP404, Diggy Tact, it's like, it's not in the same league. <laughs> As for the OPZ, it's better priced than the OP1. It also has a sampler, but for whatever reason, I don't really see it being used that much as a sampler. I find that the OPZ in general has kind of gone under the radar. I've had it for over four years now and I never really use a sampler. Maybe it's because it doesn't have uh, a script, like an internal screen within the OPZ. The Octatrack is obviously worth a mention as well in this case. The reason why I'm not doing more of a deep dive on this one is because I still have a lot to learn with it. Effects and mixing capabilities are some of the strongest in this comparison. In terms of effects, I would say that it's in the same level as the SP404 Mark II. Although you could even customize your effects even more. So this essentially allows you to construct your own builds and drops. So that's that's a really cool element of the instrument. I would suggest hitting up EasyBot. He has some really interesting and in-depth videos on the Octatrack. I would say some of the best out there. In terms of arranging and piecing together a set, again, a very, very powerful tool if it's paired together with the right gear or even just on its own. Very difficult learning curve, by far the most difficult uh, in this whole comparison. The manual feels like it's from like an engineering course or something. Uh, it's, it's dense, very in-depth, very dense. This is also the oldest instrument in this comparison because it's over 12 years old now. It's a little bit backwards compared to uh, the, you know, groove boxes and samplers of today. In pretty much every Octatrack tutorial that I've watched, the person reviewing is like, this is what it could do, but this little part, I don't know what that does, so we're not gonna cover that in this video. <laughs> the Poly and Play, this is another sampler or groove box that's entered into my collection. Very interesting and fluid workflow, you could maybe call it the Poly and Tracker on steroids. I did a first impression video specifically on the sequencer and got into how there, there's like a roll the dice type situation with the Poly and Play. It constructs patterns or starting points that you could either veto or select and maybe alter to your liking. And that's something that's pretty much consistent with the entire workflow of the instrument. So even the effects that you add, they work in that same roll, rolling the dice sort of way. I think that this is really interesting and helpful to maybe help you come up with parts that you maybe otherwise would not have because it is suggesting a lot for you. A proper groove box, tons of pattern space. There's live effects, which I have yet to explore. In terms of learning curve, the poly and play as well as the tracker were 
the most daunting looking instruments. But after spending a bunch of time with both of them, I realized how linear and logic everything is. So it didn't actually take too much time to learn them. MIDI compatibility with the Poly and Play seems a little bit buggy at this point, but hopefully that's something that they'll fix uh, with an update. And that pretty much sums it up. This is a, a deep dive. So if you guys have any questions, let all of us know in the comments. There are affiliate links to all the instruments mentioned in this video, so there's going to be a lot of them. If you end up using those links, I make a small commission from that sale at no extra charge to yourself. One of the best ways of supporting what I do, like, subscribe. Hope to see you soon, guys. Bye.